So welcome everybody at this uh, first webinar on how to solve the toll of depression on populations. And I, or I give these webinars to give an overview of the work that I've been doing in the past uh, couple of decades uh, on depression. And this has been my, yeah, I've done a lot of scientific work in this field. And now I have to retire as a professor, which is, I think, still a very good example of ageism in the Netherlands, because I'm judged not on the content or quality of my work, but on my age. And in my view, that's still ageism. But that said, I'm happy to step down as a full professor. Um, and I, but I will continue to uh, work on the things I've been, on many of the things I've been working in the past decades in a different way and not so much. But uh, I'm also happy that I don't have all the responsibilities that a professor at a university has. But I th what I want to do is I want to give an overview of the work I've been doing and mostly to give an overview of where we are now in this field. And I will do that in four webinars. They all focus on the same theme. So they all focus on the question, what can we do to solve the problem of depression on a population level, except for the traditional treatments of patients who go to a doctor or therapist to get treatments. What else can we do to solve the problem of depression, except for this conventional treatment approach. And that's, you can approach that question from several perspectives. And that's what I have been doing in my uh, career over the past decades. And so the first, the first subject is prevention, prevention of depression. And what I will do in this first lecture, I will first introduce the problem. I will explain what prevention is, and then I will go through the sp specific types of prevention, universal prevention, selective indicated prevention. And I will show you that until now, we know that some types of prevention work, but the, it's not ready yet to be implemented in routine practice. And I will explain where the best, uh, what the best next steps are. So first, the disease burden of depression. Well, it's, it is an enormous public health problem. If you look at the numbers, if you look at uh, the number of the, the, the prevalence, uh, but also the incidence, the, the number of people getting a depressive disorder every year, um, but also the fact that our treatments are just not good enough. And we can treat people, but many people don't respond. And a lot of the people who could benefit from treatment don't get treatment. For example, because uh, the, by far the majority of depressive disorders um, are in low and middle income countries where there is hardly any infrastructure for mental health care. Um, so I want to show you one graph from the um, uh, Lancet report on depression, which we wrote in 2021. This is, the, uh, this is a graph where you can see the burden of depression across the life course. So you see age on the horizontal axis and the number of years lived with disability on the vertical axis. And what you can, you can see a few things from this graph. First of all, uh, that um, depression is mostly a disorder of the adult age. And that's uh, not like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, which people get when they get older. So depression is really a disorder of the working age, like most mental disorders. And that means that it's very expensive in terms of production losses. And if you take that together, uh, the, the, the estimate 
estimated costs are about one trillion US dollars per year, which is an enormous amount. The other thing you can see from this graph is that by far the majority of the disease burden is suffered by people in low and middle income countries. And if you compare the disease burden in high income countries with those in other countries, then that's only a fraction of what we're talking about. The third thing, and that's important for prevention, is that most disorder people, most people get a depressive disorder between their 15th and 30th year. So that means if you want to do something about prevention of depression, youth is the most important target group. Uh, uh, yeah, and as I said, treatments are effective. We know that treatments work. I will come back to that in one of these lectures uh, later. Uh, but the uptake is very low. In, in a country like Holland, it's, it's only 50 to 60 percent uh, where Everybody has access to psychological treatments. But as you can imagine, in countries, in low and middle income countries, the uptake is very low, only a few percent. And that's, that's only when you look at the general population. But when you look at specific target groups like um, adolescents, but also older adults, people from ethnic minorities, uh, but also, for example, farmers. These more specific target groups, the uptake of mental health services is really very low. So then we can have good treatments, but if don't, people don't use it, then that won't contribute to a re reduction of uh, the disease burden. So what do we need? What do, what do we do in such a situation? Well, the f we, first of all, we don't know what depression is. And so we need basic research on what is it? We, we, I mean, we work with criteria from the DSM or ICD where uh, experts say, okay, you have these symptoms and then you have a disorder. But that's not based on any yeah, physical measure or any standardized uh, measure. And it's, we don't know whether it exists, in fact. Uh, we, know that, we know that it exists because we see patients suffering, but for, we don't know, for example, what a threshold is for a disorder or not a disorder. And so we really need basic research. I won't go into that because my research has focused mostly on uh, uh, clinical and applied uh, research. But what can we do from that perspective uh, to reduce the disease burden of depression on a population level? Well, first, prevention. The second is that we, we have to do something about the uh, dissemination of treatments because, in fact, only a very narrow part of a high class, highly educated, rich people, white people in high income countries use uh, 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 psychological treatments, uh, while the rest of the world doesn't have access. So what we really need is to simplify treatments, make different treatments, make different approaches to, so that we can disseminate the interventions that we have much more broadly and much better. And that's what, um, uh, and I think digital interventions are an, an important role with that. And the third thing is that we need better treatments because our treatments are good, but by far not good enough. The majority of people who get a treatment don't benefit. Um, and so, yeah, that, and that's what these lectures are about. And uh, so uh, this lecture is about prevention. One of the solutions to reduce the disease burden on a population level. So what is prevention? Well, Prevention is, it has the risk that people say, well, everything is prevention. If you, if you give therapy to people, then you prevent that they go to an inpatient setting. Uh, so prevention is, has been always a very vague term. Uh, but 
since a, since a few decades in the 1990s, the, the NIH uh, developed a, a, a definition of prevention, which, indicate, which said that everything you do before somebody meets criteria for a mental disorder is prevention. And when people do meet these criteria, then it's treatment or maintenance treatment. And there are three types of prevention. Universal prevention, aimed at a whole population, regardless of their risk status. Selective prevention, aimed at high-risk groups, and we have lots of those in mental health. Uh, uh, people who have had a traffic accident, who are refugees, who are uh, lo who lost somebody by death, who retire, who uh, all kinds of high risk groups uh, uh, there are. And selective interventions are aimed at these high risk groups. Indicated prevention is aimed at people who already have some symptoms, but do not meet the full criteria of a depressive disorder. And so, yeah, it has very, until the 1980s, 90s, people thought, okay, we, we don't know where depression comes from, so we, we cannot prevent it. But that's, of course, not true. You can do a trial to see if you can prevent it, even if you don't understand it. We don't understand what depression is now, but we still do treatment trials. And so why couldn't you? But that was the official viewpoint of the NIMH in the US at that time, that it's not possible to prevent uh, depression. But in the late 80s and 1990s, a few trials came up. <clears throat> we did a meta-analysis in 2005 to look at in which we included studies in which participants did not meet criteria for a mental disorder at baseline. Then they were randomized to the intervention or usual care, and then got another diagnostic interview to see how many of them developed a uh, mental disorder. And in 2005, uh, we, had, we had only 13 trials across all mental disorders. But in 2021, we did a new meta-analysis only for depression, and we found there were more, more than 50 trials now on uh, preventing the onset of depressive disorder. So the field really has been booming, so to say. Well, let's go to the specific types of depression uh, prevention. Well, universal prevention that's very interesting. It's done a lot on schools. You go to school and uh, you explain to students what mental health problems, in this case depression, is, and you explain what you can do about it. Because we, we know from therapy that cognitive behavioral skills can reduce mood, mood problems. And why not go to schools to explain that to kids that they how they can think differently, why behavioral activation is important, to learn social skills, to learn problem-solving skills. And that's, so that's done a lot, and that has the advantage that it's not stigmatizing. Everybody gets it, uh, regardless of whether you have uh, de depressive problems or not. Um, uh, you can do it, uh, you can organize it pretty easily. You can go to a school and then you have all kids or you can go to a work setting and you can, then you have all employees. Uh, or you can go for perinatal depression. You integrate it in perinatal services by screening all pregnant women when they go for care. But there are also disadvantages. And the, mo the most important one is that it's very difficult to show that they work because the incidence of depression is very low. Let's say one and a half to two percent of the population develops a depressive disorder within one year. So one or two out of every 100 people will develop a depressive disorder in the coming year. If you want to 
if you if you have an intervention that that reduces that to let's say one percent, you can imagine that you need enormous sample sizes. You you if you if you want to do that, you need you know twenty thousand people per condition uh, to show that your intervention has actually reduced the incidence of mental disorders. Um, but these trials have been done. Usually they don't look, they don't do diagnostic interviews, obviously, because that's, uh, that you cannot do that in 20,000 people. Usually the sample sizes are also much smaller. Um, and there's another thing which I, uh, which I wrote about uh, some time ago, which is usually forgotten. So what, what people do when they do prevention trials is they look at the level of depression uh, before the intervention and then uh, look at the other, look again after the intervention whether, and see if the, the total symptom score on depression has decreased. And then they say, okay, well, this is... Uh, uh, the, 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 the level of depression has gone down. So the intervention, the preventive intervention is effective. But that's not true. That's not true. And that's, uh, so when you look at a, at a universal population, you will, the majority of people don't have symptoms. So they, they have nothing to improve. Uh, they they just remain stable because yeah they have no symptoms and at the end they also don't have symptoms so nothing changed but there is also a group who do have symptoms and if you find that uh, your intervention has reduced the level of symptoms you probably reduce those symptoms in those people who already had depressive symptoms at the beginning uh, and so and I think that's not prevention at all. It's just another way of treatment. Uh, I wouldn't call it, maybe treatment is not the right word, but that you have not prevented people from developing uh, uh, mental health problems. Um, so what you, what, you, what you would, when it would be prevention, is, is that if the, if the people with no symptoms at baseline develop symptoms over time, and your intervention keeps them healthy. But that's never, that's hardly ever examined. And again, then you have to, then you need to, these very large sample sizes. But that this, this is, I, I, I'm always surprised when I see prevention trials not looking at the people who already have symptoms at the beginning. So I think half of the trials don't report this. And, uh, well, there was one big trial in the UK last year, and I wrote an editorial uh, about that in uh, Evidence-Based Mental Health. Uh, what they, they did a very large trial, very well de designed um, uh, in the UK on mindfulness in high schools. Uh, 5,000 people in one condition, 5,000 people in the other condition. Uh, mindfulness was introduced, people were trained, was de were developed, and they, they, well, it was, as you can imagine, very expensive, very large, well-designed trial. Everything that you can think of, they did it well. And what was the result? Zero. Uh, so they could not find any significant uh, outcome of universal prevention. And what we see in other trials, which are smaller and not so well developed, is that they usually find small effects. So an effect size of 0.2 or smaller, that's what you usually find, which can be significant because, uh, yeah, when you work with large sample sizes, that's, this can be really significant. But when you find an effect size of 0.2, in a universal population, that can mean two different things. One, it's not, it's not effective. It's an artifact. It's, uh, the, the, the studies were not done well. They were not, uh, it's, it's you, they, they just didn't do it well. But if you do it in small studies and you do it enough and not all are well, then you find a pool effect size of 0.2, which has no effect at all 
on a population level. The other possibility is that it is effective. And if you have an effect size of 0.2 in the total population, then the impact on an individual level is very low, but on a population level, it's pretty large. Uh, so if you, uh, if you treat one person out of, you, out of 100 people and you get uh, an effect size of 0.8 and you compare that to an effect size of 0.2 in a total population of 100, you can imagine that the impact of uh, the universal intervention is huge. I think this trial in the UK, and there, are, there is also one, another trial in uh, Australia, which, is, which f also had a zero result, also very big and also... So I think these interventions don't work uh, in schools. Um, we're not certain. Maybe the intervention is not good. Maybe, you know, the, the delivery was not well. We don't, we're not certain. But I think these large trials indicate that universal prevention at schools doesn't work. So what about selective and indicated prevention? Well, selective intervention is aimed at high-risk groups. And as I said, there are lots of them. There are uh, caregivers of dementia patients, uh, survivors of uh, suicide, um, uh, and there are all kinds of interventions for these high-risk groups. Um, in these trials, unfortunately, they hardly ever examine the incidence of depressive disorders. So the, it is, a, if you look, for example, uh, I started my career in caregivers of dementia patients. I got my PhD on that. And if you look at the studies in that area, they look at burden, they look at levels of depression, they look at all kinds of yeah, suffering by caregivers. But they hardly ever look whether support groups have prevented the incidence of depression. They just don't examine that. And what you also, also see is that when people participate in these interventions, they often already have a disorder because that's why they need support, that's why they need help, that's why they, they go there and don't want to be alone in this situation. So many of them already have a disorder. And so in terms of preventing the onset of depressive disorders, this is all, we, we hardly know whether, I will come back, I will show you some results of our meta-analysis, they probably work, uh, they probably can prevent the onset, but most research in this area doesn't know that. And what's important is that the predictive value of most risk factors is very low. And people tend to forget that. Uh, uh, so many people say, well, why they ask, why did you get depressed? And then, then people say, yeah, I had this traffic accident or I became unemployed or something like that. But when you look at the numbers, by far the majority of the people who get unemployed do not get depressed. I saw uh, a couple of months ago in JAMA Psychiatry a uh, paper on caregivers, uh, I think for cancer patients, I'm not sure. And they found that uh, uh, people who were not caregiver had a 4% chance of developing a depressive disorder in the coming year. And the people who were caregiver had an, a risk of 5.8%, something like that, to develop a depressive disorder. And that was highly significant. But from a prevention perspective, a risk of 5.8% to develop a, de a depressive disorder in the coming year, that's not something you can work with. That's not something useful uh, uh, because more than 94% of the people in that situation will not develop a depressive disorder. So how can you convince these people that it's important to get a preventive intervention when 95% doesn't get, doesn't get a depression? And there are no good uh, predictive factors, by the way. So uh, the best prediction, uh, predictive factor is 
having a parent with a depressive disorder. And there, there are studies showing that 50% of people who have a depressed parents also develop a depression before their 20th life year. But if you look at it from a prevention perspective, 50% is a lot, uh, but that goes over time. So let's say they start developing depression when they're 12, and at 20, 50% have developed a depressive disorder. But that means that you have to, that, that in each of these years, it's still only 6% who develop a disorder. And still, by far, the majority won't develop a depressive disorder in the coming year. But that is what we need for preventive interventions, because we need to prevent that they develop a depression. So indicated prevention is aimed at people who have symptoms, but no depressive disorder. And the, they, the interventions work, and they, I will show you. They, the effects are not very large, but compared to treatments, they don't do that bad at all. And it's relatively easy to identify people at schools, at the workplace, in perinatal care, in, in, in general medical care. But if, if you, I, we, in the Netherlands, we have had a system for a very long time that we could offer indicated prevention to anybody who wants it for free. And when we looked at the numbers, uh, I did that when I worked at the Trimbles Institute and a couple of years later, we found that among this enormous number of people with subthreshold depression, only 1% was willing to participate in indicated prevention. So we did a <coughs> meta-analysis to see whether preventive interventions work. These, these included 50 trials. There are now, again, I think about 10 more. So the number of trials is really rapidly increasing. It was 50 trials, only one universal, makes sense. Uh, most indicated, because that's the most easy to organize. Very different target groups, adolescents, uh, uh, pregnant women, general medical patients, primary care patients, etc. So you can uh, wonder whether you can pull those studies, but we did. <coughs> most use CBT, like in most psychological interventions, but also IPT and all kinds of other interventions. Well, most were done in high-income countries. So uh, only three of these trials were done in low and middle income countries. Um, uh, the, the, the quality was not good enough, uh, but we found very little heterogeneity and we found very few predictors of outcome. But here's what we found. Indicated prevention works. So if you get an indicated uh, preventive intervention, uh, the incidence rate ratio is 0.81, meaning that the risk of developing depression in the coming year is 19% smaller if you get a preventive intervention compared to not getting an intervention. That's it. For the first time, we also found that selective prevention is effective with about the same outcome. So we can uh, we can reduce the risk with about 20% of developing new depressive disorders in people who do not have a disorder at baseline, which is good news. But as I said, the uptake is very low. So of these trials, I've been involved uh, over the past 20 years in about five of these trials, uh, of these 50 trials. These are a few uh, uh, examples. So this one was the, was a very nice one, uh, led by Claudia Bundrock, who was also here in our department for a while, and uh, with a group of David Ebert. Uh, and we, it was done in Germany. And so we, what we used is we had a pretty large sample size. Uh, we randomized people to a web-based intervention of problem solving and behavioral activation or usual care. 
And uh, we excluded, of course, people with an existing major depressive disorder. And we found that the incidence of major depression was significantly smaller in the uh, intervention group compared to the control group. So I was also involved in another recent uh, large trial in India uh, where we also found that problem solving de delivered by lay health counselors in India to older adults prevented the onset of major depression uh, there. So if you so, okay, we know that uh, um, uh, indicated prevention works. So how would that look like if we would implement it that in routine care? Well, let's say we have a population of 100,000 people. 5,000 of those have subthreshold depression. We know that from epidemiological studies. Let's say that 10% that of those people participate, and that's high. Usually it's much lower. But let's say we can, we can uh, convince uh, uh, 500 people to participate in indicated prevention. That means that we have prevented 36 cases, which is not very large. When you look at this population, in the next year, there will be 2,000 people developing a depressive disorder. And if we do this, um, if, we, if we do this kind of preventive interventions, we only prevent 1.8% of those incident cases. So we could increase that by, uh, by increasing participation rates or by increasing the effects of the interventions. But this is what it is. So the impact is pretty modest. I must say I will show in a later example that treatments are not that much better. Treatments are also effective, but not that effective. And the impact on the prevalence in a population is also limited for um, uh, treatments. So where are we? Well, it's unclear of universal, if universal prevention works. Probably not, I would say. Selective intervention is promising, but probably most selective interventions are a way of indirectly treating people with existing mental health problems. And that's also uh, related to the very low predictive strength of most risk factors that we know in mental health. Indicated prevention works, but the uptake is too low to make an impact. So what do we do? This is where we are in the prevention field. So what are the next steps? What should we do? Uh, well, first of all, we need more money. And that sounds a bit uh, weird. Uh, everybody wants more money. But there is research showing that, um, uh, that of all the research in biomedical uh, going to biomedical research, 7% goes to mental health research, uh, which is much lower than the total disease burden of mental health problems, which is double that. So the mental health research already gets very little money. Only, and of that 7%, only 7% goes to prevention research. So if we really want to yeah, make prevention work. We need much more, much more research. We need large trials. We need large epidemiological studies. Um, and especially in universal and selective uh, prevention. I mean, doing a trial with 20,000 people to prevent the onset of depression, that's huge. But it can be done if there is much research. And in other fields, these trials are them. So why not in mental health? Why not if everybody is convinced that depression is such an important mental health condition? Why not do these trials? Um, <clears throat> well, we also need uh, research on the uptake. 
because we need, we, as I said, the uptake of uh, preventive interventions is very low. People don't want to participate in interventions when they don't have a condition. And they may have a risk that they will get it in the next year or in five years. The people are not motivated to do that. So we need to develop better interventions, which are less invasive, which are easier, which, are, uh, which can be done by people without too much burden. And I think we need much more research into, yeah, more structural factors. And I, uh, I wrote a paper about this with uh, Hans Ormel. And if you really want to do something about prevention, and I, I, I wrote, for example, um, I read, for example, a book on inequality. And if you look at the association between inequalities and mental health problems, uh, that's huge. It's not only mental health problems, it's teen pregnancies, it's criminal rates, it's uh, uh, feeling safe, uh, feel, have the level of well-being, all being highly associated with inequality. So we can try to, uh, to do all this stuff on prevention and schools and work with all these individuals and develop things. But one factor, inequality, would, would have, if you would reduce that, that has a huge impact on anything. So uh, sometimes I think it's better to become a politician uh, and make sure that things work in the right way uh, so that mental health is saved. And if you really want to do something about mental health problems, you have to think about all the political decisions that are made in terms of what are the consequences of for mental health. That's the only way to really do something about it. And then it's only not only uh, that 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 we are just you know working in the margins of what you can do on on, on an individual level, but there are also other important determinants that that are not targeted in preventive efforts like poor parenting, uh, interparental conflict. We know that most mental health problems get their basis when children are very young. And uh, focusing on these kinds of problems when children are very young, that's the most important, uh, that's a very important determinant that, ha that have not been targeted enough in preventive uh, efforts. But it's also things about, as I said, about inequalities. It's also social status, migration. Um, so you, you really have to try to embed political issues, um, mental health policies into political issues. And you can examine those. You can do community trials in which you have communities in which uh, measures that can be taken are compared to communities that go on as if nothing happened. These trials are done uh, also, for example, in the alcohol prevention field. Um, so that's, we, we, sh we really need these, these trials also in mental health care. And another thing that I think is a very promising strategy, and I wrote about that uh, uh, two years ago, indirect prevention, but also indirect treatment. Which means that, I will give an example, there is one trial in JAMA Psychiatry in people who have sleep problems and no major depressive disorder. And these people are treated for insomnia. And they also looked at the incidence of major depressive disorder in these people. And they found that after a while, the incidence of major depression was significantly lower in the people who got the tr insomnia treatment compared to the people who did not get the insomnia treatment. And that's a very good example of indirect treatment, uh, uh, indirect prevention. Uh, because you, insomnia is not a very stigmatized condition. Many people sleep bad. And if you 
get treatment for that. You learn in uh, courses what you can do about it. Uh, and then indirectly, you also prevent that people get a depressive disorder. But we can do that in many different ways. So I've been involved in the development of the Caring Universities project at the Dutch universities, where this is a basic fundamental idea. We focus on problems which are given by students, which is not depression. Many students uh, have depression. They do want to do something about it. But the most important problem, we've talked with students, the most important problem is procrastination. Don't do what you should do. Uh, perfectionism, low self-esteem. And we, what we, the idea is that we develop all kinds of digital tools for the problems that students suffer from, which they indicate as the most important problems. And we know that the ones who participate in interventions for procrastination are often also the ones who are depressed. So if you, and maybe in the other ones, they will develop depression. So if we focus on procrastination indirectly, we also do something about depression. Uh, because we learn cognitive behavioral skills, just like in depression, but then focus on procrastination. But that also works on depression. So and uh, you can, we, we do that for university students, but you can also do that for in the work settings, in perinatal care, in uh, general medical care. And I think this is really, then you don't talk about mental health problems. You just focus on the problems that people deal with in everyday life. And then you build a preventive system, so to say, without focusing on the problems themselves. Okay, so this was my first talk and I wanna thank you for your attention. <laughs>